Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Bible study. Yep, that time when you and I are hanging out for a little bit, about 40 minutes to an hour, going through some scripture, learning, gleaning, growing from the Word of God, seeing what it says to us, what it was saying then, what it was saying now, helping us to better understand the Word, because in getting to know the Word, we get to know God, and that's what it's all about, you and I becoming more like Jesus every single day. And uh, His Word, man, is the best way to get to know Him. So we are in the book of Mark, chapter 14. Last week, we looked at the betrayal. And tonight, we're going to look at the start of this series of trials that take place, almost like a kangaroo court, as you could say, as you'll, you'll understand why as we get into it. So we're going to be looking at verses, uh, I believe, 53 to to about uh, 65 tonight. That's where we were going to be camping out. So if you got your Bibles, get them out. Notepads, pens, beverage of choice. Drinking some lime buble. We are going to start by reading uh, Mark chapter 14. We're going to read verses 53 to 59. It says, Then they led Yeshua away, to the Kohen Gadol, and to the ruling Kohenim elders and to the Torah scholars gathered. Uh, Peter had followed him from a distance right into the courtyard of the Kohen Gadol, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself by the fire. Just in case you're wondering, that means high priest. Uh, now the ruling uh, Koenim and all of the Sanhedrin kept trying to get evidence against Yeshua so they could put him to death but they weren't finding any. Many were giving false testimony against him. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't want to read too far. Many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony wasn't consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony uh, against him, saying, we have heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. So it's going to be interesting as we go through this. You'll see this. And so we, we come to really the section of our text tonight that addresses, like I said, the trials of Jesus that he's, that he's going to go through. And it's, it's going to be several trials um, that we'll discover not only tonight, but in the, in the next couple of weeks, right? The first round of trials, they're, they're, they would consist of kind of a, a religious, a a Jewish trial, while the others consist of more of a, a civil Gentile trial that's going to be led by the Romans. And according to Mark's gospel, starting in verse 53, he states that, that Jesus was led away from the garden, right? We had just seen him. He was betrayed in the garden. He's led away from the garden to the high priest's home before the Sanhedrin council. But as we read further, we notice that Mark's account begins the trial with Caiaphas leading the proceedings, whereas John's gospel begins with Annas leading the trial. And the question becomes, chronologically speaking, which high priest does Jesus meet first? And you actually can find that answer. You got to go back to the book of John in John chapter 18, verse 24. It says this, so Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So again, I guess if you're studying, like when I study, another question arises, right? Why is Jesus first led to Annas if, if Caiaphas is the high priest during that year? And so you, uh, once you begin to study, you, you realize that Annas served as the high priest from about A.D. 6-7 to about A.D. 14. And he was later deposed by uh, Valerius Gratus, uh, who was the Roman governor at the time. But what happened was Annas retained control of the priesthood and he was succeeded by his sons, including his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And therefore, the, the imagery of Annas's role becomes like that of a, almost like a godfather. Look at it that way, right? Not only did Annas have such control of the, of the priesthood, but he was the head of the private money changing business as well. So with Jesus having interrupted his business, we saw a little while back at the temple, right? On several occasions, it becomes clear that 
kind of Annas, he has maybe got a personal grudge against Jesus. Therefore, he is kind of pulling rank, pulling power uh, to address Jesus first. And this ultimately leads to a trial to begin with Annas and then move to Caiaphas within the same compound. And despite the trial beginning with, with Annas, we, we come to realize that through the gospel records that some serious, man, there's some serious, serious flaws in these proceedings. Because when you get in with Matthew, Mark, and John's account, all three of those accounts showcase multiple cases of abuse, kind of of this Jewish uh, jurisprudence and ignoring really the Jewish law within these trials. They break all of them, right? It is in the early morning that John's gospel mentions that, that Peter had, had followed Jesus to the high priest's home to see what was going to happen to him. And then it says there's an unnamed disciple, potentially, right? Uh, the beloved disciple John uh, helps Peter to get into the courtyard. And most scholars actually would agree that the Apostle John and his family, they had a, a familiar contact to the priesthood through Salome and Elizabeth. And so this supposed relationship allowed the doorkeeper to really permit Peter to accompany John through the gates into the courtyard. And so now what we see, Peter's now in the courtyard, right, of Caiaphas' house on the cold, dark early morning around the exact same guys that have just arrested Jesus. In, John, in, in the book of John, in John 18, it actually mentions that he's standing near a, a fire to warm himself. And I think the fact that Peter has not been arrested at this point, right, uh, is in light of the fire shows that the officers, they probably couldn't clearly recognize him amongst everyone else. It, it really wasn't standing out. And so what happens, this allows Peter to kind of get some, the inside scoop to, and, and the farce of this trial that's about to unfold. And it's from this point on that Peter's narration fades to the background as Jesus and the illegalities of this trial, what's happens, they're going to rise to the, to the forefront. Now, because we're walking through Mark's gospel, we, we got to make sure that we stick within the text, right? Uh, but I do believe it's important that we identify a few things from the, from the first trial documented by John. And here's what you and I, that we should take away. A couple things, right? There's, there's several issues, actually, that, that help us identify that these beginning proceedings, that they were illegal in their initiation, Right? And the second thing we got to understand is the first half of this religious trial under Annas was without the authority of a specific charge. So let's look at the, the illegalities right, and, and of this, this religious trial in which these guidelines were actually set by the Mishnah that they had, which was the, the kind of oral law and tradition. First is the thing that we see is no trials were actually to occur before the morning of sacrifice. So here we have a trial, right? All trials were to be public. They needed to be public. Therefore, deeming secret trials such as this one that's taking place, they would be deemed illegal, right? All Sanhedrin trials were to be, be held in the hall of judgment in the temple area, not in the high priest's home like this one is taking place. In capital cases, required a minimum of 23 judges. Uh, however, due to the trial beginning at night, the required number wasn't available. Number five, this, and, and I think this one speaks volumes uh, in, in this case, right? There had to be an, an assumption of innocence until proven guilty. Similar to what we have here in Canada, you would think, right, that we see unfolding. Um, and this was essential within the Jewish jurisprudence, right? It was essential to this. Um, number six, an accused person could not testify against himself, which is why Jesus responds the way that he does in John 18, verses 20 to 21, which then leads to the seventh issue we should have a problem with. There had to be at least two witnesses, right? Two witnesses in which their testimonies had to be in perfect agreement. And that goes all the way back to Numbers, to the book of Deuteronomy, right? That's where we get that from. 
And I think lastly, we, we, we see that this preliminary trial ended with no specific charge, right? There was no charge given. And, and this corroborates Jesus's very words in John 18, 23, where he said, hey, if I've spoken wrongly, if I've said something that testifies to the wrong, um, but if rightly, why, why do you strike me, right? In other words, what he's saying is, show me the evidence. Show me the evidence of my guilt or my wrongdoing or my wrong saying. You got to show it to me. And the reality was there was no cause, nothing for Jesus's arrest, except for the fact that he was hated, despised, and reviled for who he was and for what he came to do. That is it right? Kind of what we see happening in this kangaroo court that's happening here in our city with the convoy trial, right? For those mischief charges. Crazy what we see happening here. It's all because it was put a bad mark on the city and some city officials look bad. So let's take it out with these kind of trumped up charges, right? So we got to understand with this background, that, that was my little rant, right? So with this background in mind, we, we now pick back up the second trial that is being held before Caiaphas in, in verses 53 to 59 of Mark 14, what we just read. And it's after the initial hearing by Annas that he sends Jesus to Caiaphas. And, and it's at this point, Jesus is standing before the Sanhedrin council, right, to be sentenced to death. However, Mark makes mention of several judicial issues that arise even before the council. And it can be assumed at this point that both Nicodemus and, and Joseph of Arimathea, they were absent from these proceedings. And if you remember, I mentioned before, one of the things required by Jewish law was there had to be two or three witnesses that could attest to the crime that was committed. Along with those two or three witnesses must, must be a consistent testimony that had to be corroborated separately, not together. Hey, let's talk about it, what, what happened together, right? To refrain from the false testimonies. But when we read verse 50, sorry, when we read verse 55b, tells us what the council's persistent to find consistent testimony, what happened? They failed to find any, none, none was found. And so it becomes very clear, right? And even for you and I, the reader, like to be able to see right through this, it becomes very clear that most witnesses, what were they? They were recruited. They spewed false uh, testimony, and the council let those matters go unchecked. And I think this even more shows you and I, the reader, that the intent of this council was actually to distort justice by any means to, to attain what they wanted. They wanted to kill Jesus, and they weren't going to stop at anything that was going to keep that from happening. And I think one thing that the text makes evidently known is really the hearts of these men were set upon evil. In a turn, what happens? They completely distort justice. And really, what makes this proceeding such a farce when you're reading it is that according to the, to the Mishnah, those who provided false testimony, you know what should have happened to them? They should have been put to death. That's according to their own oral tradition in law. They should have been put to death. But we find the council not condemning, but actually cooperating with these false witnesses to attain the verdict that they had what? Already prepared. They already had a verdict, right? They all, here's the verdict. Now, how are we going to get there? How are we going to get the testimonies to get us to the verdict we already know that it's going to be? And at this point, right, these men are simply following legal formalities to get their end result. That's it. They already know what their end result, right, is. If the, and if there ever was a moment in which justice was abused, right, we see it happen all over today, right, and, and the system of law and governance misused, man, this is a perfect example of it. Yet it, it would be the same abused and, and suffering Jesus who would die soon for even such as these. Those guys doing that bidding, lying, deceiving, manipulating, he died for them. And in verses 57 and 59, Mark tells us that these false testimonies, they continued to come forth. Uh, 
And this time, some stood up, provided false testimony, which is, in which they say, Jesus said something he didn't, right? He didn't say that. And it's in verse 58. We, hey, we heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another one made without hands. And in a plain reading through Mark and in, in Matthew's kind of account, we see these two testimonies. They're not the same. And Mark emphatically notes it as false in, in Mark 14, 59. Mark's gospel states that one, wis, wit, one witness says, I will destroy this temple. Matthew's gospel states the other witness says, I am able to destroy the temple. But to, to verify what was said, we need to see how these witnesses distorted Jesus' words in the first place. And it's in John 2.19, we have evidence that these men, what has happened? They have completely taken Jesus' words out of context, you know, like so many people do in the Bible, right? And, and Jesus' his, his very own words were misinterpreted in, in that he was actually speaking cryptically, right? That's what he was doing. He was referring to the temple as what? His body. He was referring to it as his body being destroyed, yet will be raised in how many days? Three days, because he knew what was coming down. Whereas these men heard about the destruction of the temple and assumed it was about this ornate building that Solomon had built, and, and it was being threatened. And actually to threaten the temple in that day would have been and deemed a capital offense, punishable, right? So it becomes clear that the means of garnering a proper witness, what's happening, it's backfiring, which moves the high priest to press Jesus further, Right. And, and, and let's read what it says in uh, in verses 60 to 62. Let me get it in my Bible here. Uh, then the Kohim Gadal stood up in the middle and questioned Yeshua, saying, do you have no answer? What is it they're testifying against you? But keeping silent, Yeshua did not answer again. The, Ko, the Kohim Gadal questioned him. Are you... Uh, Mashiach, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Yeshua, and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the powerful one and coming with the clouds of heaven. So it's after the failure, really, of the witnesses with their lack of agreement uh, that Caiaphas, what does he do? He kind of speaks up and, and stands forward in an attempt to really question Jesus, right? Which ultimately leads him to putting Jesus under oath. And so what is Caiaphas doing? He is seeking to rouse a response from Jesus based on the false accusations that have been spewed by these false witnesses. And the natural inclination of the human heart in, in moments of injustice is what? Is to cry out loud for justice to be served. However, Jesus, what does he do? He recognizes this tactic because he knows the intention. He knows the intention of the hearts. And so if Jesus responds, what are they going to do? They're simply going to distort what he says to prove him wrong. It's almost like whatever Jesus says in self-defense will result in self-incrimination. That's kind of this trial that's taking place. So in response to being placed under oath, uh, un under such an kind of an unjust scrutiny, what does Jesus do? He takes the high road of silence. He remains silent, right? And Jesus, his silence not only spoke to the reality of the importance of not needing to defend your character amidst these false accusations, but it also came with these messianic overtones. And for that, you got to go back to Isaiah 53, 7. And it's so, again, think about it, almost 700 years before this event is taking place. Isaiah prophesied this in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. What's he say? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. It's almost like it would be the silence of our Savior that not only spoke evidently of his innocence, but really mightily of his willingness to actually suffer on our behalf, on their behalf. 
if you go into Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 26, uh, I think it's verse 63, actually records Jesus' silence towards the high priest line of questioning. What happens, it apparently it irritated Caiaphas to the point that he placed Jesus under oath. And that statement proceeded with, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. That was Caiaphas's question, right? Mark's gospel records that the high priest questioned Jesus in a similar manner, but rather than, than saying God, he used the term the blessed one. And blessed one was, uh, was a title found in the sense only here in the New Testament, which is a Jewish substitute for God. Both these titles pointed to Jesus's claim as him being the Messiah. And it's from this kind of binding question within this trial that Jesus emphatically and unqui unquivocally right, answers the question of the high priest. Doesn't, doesn't hold back, but lets it rip by just saying, I am. I am. And that phrase in the Greek is ego e imai, which confirmed that the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Right? It's, it's the phrase, I am, is familiar phrase that Jesus used kind of in the garden. It's the same phrase that Yahweh used with Moses in the burning bush. And Jesus emphatically and declaratively states that he is the Son of God and the Messiah sent from God. What, what he's doing in the plainest terms, Jesus declared himself right in that moment, right before the high priest, he declared himself as God. But here is kind of but a piece of truth that speaks to the kind of clear Christology of Mark's gospel, right? Not only does Jesus make this statement, but, but he further, he builds upon it by stating that, that all will see in a future day. What are they going to see? They're going to see Jesus sitting at the right hand of power, uh, which as we, if you go to Psalm 110, it is a place of great authority and high honor as well as him coming with the clouds of heaven. What, what Jesus is saying here is not, it not only speaks of the guarantee of his resurrection, but it affirms that his return in his second coming, which will be in what? In judgment and to rule in power into that millennial reign. The suffering servant, what, what's really happening here? In other words, the suffering servant must first be crucified and then raised in power before he comes back to earth reigning as a victorious king who would unleash total judgment upon all who have committed injustices towards him and it's after that jesus responds in this manner it says if the high priest man it just it, he boils over right he boils with anger which leads him to tearing his robe and and rendering a false verdict and let's read the rest of it verse 63 to to 65 and it says tearing his clothes the kohen gadol says why do we still need witnesses you've heard the blasphemy what seems right to you then all uh, condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, blindfolded him, and beat him with their fists, saying, prophesy. Also the guards slapped him around. So Caiaphas is freaking out, tears his robes, right? It, 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 what did that mean? It, it kind of signifies expressing great sorrow, great, great horror. I can't believe this has just happened right in front of me. And this gesture was a form of uh, was a formal judicial act, and not a, a simply an act of outrage. Right? This type of response was forbidden as practice in legal proceedings, except for blasphemy uttered before the court. So it's likely that the high priest responded this way because of Jesus's attestation of being the Messiah, the Son of God. But when we come to understand what blasphemy is, it isn't the slandering or the diminishing of God's name or character, right? Because Jesus 
uh, it is the slandering or the diminishing of God's name or character, which Jesus did neither. He didn't do any of those, right? Not only is Jesus's, uh, not only in, is Jesus the response and, and provision by which God, that he would accomplish his promises through, but he mentions that he will be seated at the right hand of power by which God will seat him. God's going to put him in that seat. But it's at this point, really, the religious leaders, they're not interested in facts and truth, but simply being as close to their truth as possible. And now because of the high priest, he uses the tearing of the robes as a means of misdirection, right? Hey, it's all theatrics. And this is why in verse 63b, the high priest pushes further in saying, what further need do we have of any witnesses? Right? In other words, we've, we've just heard it. It's enough for me, and it should be enough for you. And what becomes apparent is when Caiaphas attempts to charge Jesus with blasphemy, he himself actually becomes the blasphemer. Yet Jesus, the innocent one, stands before the guilty to what? To redeem humanity. Man, in amazing. The full weight of injustice had come against the only innocent one to have ever walked the face of the earth. Only one. The only one. And now he's been convicted of a crime which he did not or could never commit. And this becomes kind of really the, uh, uh, the very picture of the hearts of the depravity of men and women, right? Uh, we, we naturally seek to do what is right in our own eyes even if at times it's at the expense of others. Man, you check out Psalm 53, verse 1 and 3. It says this, The fool has said in his heart, there's what? There is no God. They are corrupt and have committed abomination, injustice. There is no one who does good. In verse 2 of Psalm 53, God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there's anyone who understands who seeks after God. Every one of them turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. It's the truth, right? If our hearts, your heart, my heart, if it's not turned to the truth, what's going to happen, right? It will lead further to this internal spiritual death and destruction and this separation from God. Truth is not found within ourselves. Rather, it's found in a sovereign person, and that is in Jesus, in Jesus alone, right? And it's in him alone who, who, who made truth both verbally and visually known, right? And the reality is no one apart from the Spirit's illumination desires to do good or to seek righteous, but simply seeks to remain in darkness. But if we read what, what, what John says from, in, from Jesus' own lips in, in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Verse 20, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed spiritually depraved minds will only see what they want to see every single time right darkness will always cringe in the sight of light at whatever cost and it's going to try to suppress it and and this is the situation really that jesus is is faced with and it paints a picture of why the people of Israel, why they weren't able to recognize their very own Messiah. And it's from this point that the high priest demands a, a, a unanimous guilty verdict, which according to law was not legal because the verdict had to be decided by all members of the council. And being it that only the high priest spoke to this kind of false verdict means what? He broke the law and, and only one of many that he broke and it's even under the jewish law this decision could not be pronounced on the same day as the trial verdict but it required at least a 24-hour waiting period according to their own law and secondly the reality of all the the 70 and the 71 jewish council members arguing in favor of guilt could not be done 
they could only argue in favor of acquittal. And so the basis of this is you are innocent until proven guilty. And the reality is with all the witnesses before the court, no testimony held true. Even the ones that were the encouraged testimonies, right? And it was this, it was from this point that all the council agreed that Jesus, he was be condemned and he was deserving of death. And Jesus would now be sent before the whole council for a consultation for their verdict to be given to the Roman government. And this marking the third Jewish religious trial that Jesus is going to go through. And for this, right, we know, we read he's blindfolded, he's slapped around, beaten with fists, spat upon, he's mocked by those who have arrested him. In, and we saw that in verse 65. And it was the blindfolding that led the guards to ask Jesus the sarcastic statement, prophesy, go ahead, prophesy now. In a sense that since you are the Messiah, you should know who's hitting you, right? Tell us who hit you. But as Jesus does, right, he doesn't retaliate. He doesn't respond in anger. What does he do? He takes the abuse. He takes the full weight of the blows that are there and that are coming his way. And these slaps weren't just a mere sign of dishonor, but they, they're actually literally power blows to the face, right? And these are the blows that Jesus took for you and he took for me. These are the blows that Jesus, that he fully embraced, right? Knowing what would we be before him. And that is the joy, right? It says, for the joy set before him endured the cross. Mind blowing, right? I, I, I think that is so in, incredible. Um, and I, I'm so thankful that every blow that he felt, man, that was for you, that it was for me, right? That upon the cross, he took it all, all the pain in, that he, he went through and inflicted was, was embraced for humanity. That means you and me. All mockery was received for humanity, for you and me. He took it all upon himself for all of humanity, for you and in me, and I love, let, let me just end on this verse, right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is what? The author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, what did he do? He endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, we're so thankful for your incredible sacrifice. God, and when we read your word and we, we see how wrongfully accused you were, but you stood there and you took it because you knew it was the only way. It was the only way, the only way to redeem humanity, the only way that we can enter into a relationship for you. And, and for that, we are so grateful. God, and, and as we're coming into the season where people will celebrate your birth, God, I pray it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder that you were born with the sole purpose to die. Not so people can get gifts and, and celebrate that. Heck, we know you weren't even born on December 25th. But it's a reminder that you were born to die. And we are so thankful that you saw your mission through. And forgive us. Forgive us for being like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And turning our back and, and wanting a different outcome in, in situations and circumstances. We just make the choice to trust you and to put you first to walk in obedience to you. Let your word continue to come alive in our heart. And as we study your word, we want to know you more. We want to know you more. We love you. We give you praise, honor, and glory in your wonderful name. And everybody said, amen. Well, bless you guys. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you out tomorrow night, Bikers Church, as we dive into week number three of Jonah. It's a great week planned for you. It's a week of second chances. How many can use a second chance? Well, you got to find out. You got to show up. Bless you guys. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.